I'd like to read a little bit out of 1 Samuel chapter 1, and then we'll read a verse or two out of chapter 2 and chapter 3, and then keep your Bibles open as we'll be preaching down through the text tonight. We know that 1 Samuel chapter 1, uh, this is my favorite book in all the Old Testament, and I appreciate the lessons the Lord teaches us through it, the prophecies in it, and just the overall blessing that the chapters of 1 Samuel is. But what we find when we come in to 1 Samuel chapter 1 is the story doesn't start on a high note. The story starts with somebody with a burden. It starts with a woman who's got a heavy burden in her life because she has a prayer that's gone unanswered. I'm sure that you had prayers that you've prayed for for years and years and years, and it just seemed like, Lord, are you ever going to answer what I'm asking you about? Prayers that seem like they go on for a long time, and it seems like you ask and it doesn't get better. You ask and it gets worse, and that seemed to be the case in Hannah's life. And what we end up finding, and you know, is the namesake of this book, Samuel. This is the story early in the text of one of Israel's mightiest prophets that ever will be. The story of Samuel and how this woman longed for this child. I mean, she'd come to the temple every year begging God, Lord, if you'll just give me a child, I'd give him back to you if you'd give him to me. Lord, that's all I want. My heart's desire more than anything else is I just want a child. She longed for this child. And then when the Lord gave her this child, there's no doubt she loved this child. I bet there probably wasn't ever a mother that loved a child any more than Hannah loved this little bundle of joy that God had put in her life. After all that she'd gone through and all the praying and all the turmoil and all the persecution she even took from her fellow wife of Elkanah, uh, all the problems that she went through with that woman poking at her about you're never going to have a child. And I'm sure the devil whispered in her ear, God's never going to do what you're asking him to do. Brother, can you imagine how much she loved this child? How much she just loved holding him. How much she loved watching him learn to walk and learn to talk and learn to eat and just all the things that come along with having a child come into the world. She didn't just long for this child and she didn't just love this child. This child was her life. I mean, brother, this child, her whole life was wrapped up in this youngin. And man, her every waking moment was sought thanking God for what God had done in giving her what she'd prayed for. But tonight, what I want to show you is not just the fact that she longed for this child and she loved this child and this child was her life. This is where we're going to anchor at tonight. I want you to notice that she loaned this child. I want you to notice that she loaned this child. Notice what your Bible said in chapter number 1, and we'll begin reading in verse number 27. Chapter 1, verse 27, The Lord has graciously given her this child. And verse 27, she says this, For this child I prayed, and the Lord hath given me my petition which I asked of him. Therefore also I have lent him to the Lord. As long as he liveth, he shall be lent to the Lord. And he worshiped the Lord there. Come to chapter 2, verse number 20, if you will. Chapter 2, verse number 20. The Bible said, And Eli blessed Elkanah and his wife, and said, The Lord give thee seed of this woman for the loan, this loan is Samuel himself for the loan which is lent to the Lord and they went unto their own home and then I want you to notice in chapter 3 and down in verse number 20 what the Bible says about Samuel chapter 3 verse number 20 the Bible said in all Israel from Dan even to Beersheba knew that Samuel was established to be a prophet of the Lord. I'd like to preach for a few minutes tonight on this subject. Alone that made a prophet. Alone that made a prophet tonight. 
Now, I, I don't know uh, how much you do in investments or things of that nature. I don't have any myself uh, in this world, but I, I hear people talking about them. we got several folk in our church that have investments and things of that nature, and I think that's a good thing to plan for the future and such as that. But as I begin to look at this stuff and think about it and, and all, I, I hear people say things like this, Brother Christian. They say, well, this this what you invest in here uh, in your portfolio or whatever, it, it's a... It's it's a short-term investment where you're looking to get a quick gain in this short-term investment. But most people that are smart with their money are interested in those little short-term high-risk investments whereby you may not get much of anything uh, out of what you've put in. What they're looking for is those long-term investments whereby you loan and then just leave it. And over time, it just accrues and accrues and accrues. Can I say say this evening, if you invest your whole life in this world, if you invest your whole life as a child, God living for this world, can I say it's a short-term loan with a very short-term payoff? As a matter of fact, Jesus said about the Pharisees that was living for their payoff here, he said this, he said, verily, they have their reward. In other words, their reward was a temporal, superficial reward that passed away just like that. But Jesus said, here's, here's, the, good, here's the good investment. Lay up for yourselves treasure in heaven, where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt, and where thieves don't break through and steal. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and then all these things shall be added unto you. And can I say tonight, there's not one person in the building, I don't care how old you are, and I don't care how young you are, or anywhere in between, there's not one of us that don't have something that we can loan to the Lord. There's not one of us tonight that don't have something we can loan to the Lord, and the Lord make a profit out of. Now, not have something you can give to God and God make a P-R-O-P-H-E-T out of it, but everybody's got something you can give to God and he can make a P-R-O-F-I-T out of it. I mean, we find this woman, she got a P-R-O-P-H-E-T. She got a man prophet. But all of us tonight, we've got a life we can give to the Lord and if we'll let the Lord have it and we'll do things by the way the Lord says do it, somewhere down the road we'll look back and say, look what God has done the Lord has made a profit out of my life. Can I say too many Christians want to invest in their self and invest in a world that is temporal and that is fleeting and that is passing away and then get down to the end of their life and wonder why God hasn't used their life to do more. But can I say there's some of us that we've made our mind up. There is nothing better than serving Jesus. There's nothing better than the house of God. There's nothing better than serving in the Lord. Now I'm telling you brother the rewards are out of this world. I like what Abraham said. Oh Abraham if people looked at his life they'd have said what's Abraham doing out there? I mean if you'd have talked to Lot. Lot's living down yonder in Sodom. I mean brother he's in the big lights in the big city. He's having a big time and somebody would have said hey you got any family? He said yeah I got one crazy uncle and they said what's his name? His name's Abraham. Well what's Abraham doing? He ain't doing nothing and he just living out there in the woods raising cattle, raising kids and walking around looking up in the stars and talking to God. I mean he ain't doing nothing but when it got down to the end of it everything Lot invested in life it all just went up in smoke just like that. But Abraham, Abraham's loan that he gave to God is going on. It's still reaping dividends and it'll just keep on reaping dividends on out into eternity. I think to myself, brother, I, 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 I'm not much, but I think to myself I look back and my mom and daddy got saved. My mama got saved two years before I was born and my daddy got saved the year that I was born and I didn't know anything but growing up in church. My mom and daddy raised us around this right here. My mom and daddy made their mind up. If it's happening at the house of God, we was going to be there. My daddy worked a job. My daddy worked a job all his life until he retired and served the Lord too. But he made life about serving Jesus. He didn't make life about his job. He didn't make life about sports. He didn't make life about the temporal. He made life about the eternal. And I look now and I see what God's doing in my mom and daddy's life and through now my life and my children's life. And I see because they loaned everything they had to the 
Lord it has now made a profit brother Doug I couldn't help but think as I was sitting over there tonight and I looked up here and saw uh, you and your wife and all of your babies and your, your granddaughter and your daughter-in-law I thought that's just two people that way back yonder they just loaned everything to God and look what God has done with the little loan that they gave brother I was looking at your family the other night and y'all sitting around the piano singing and I thought look what God can do when you just loan everything to the Lord there ain't nothing better than loaning everything you've got to the Lord every young person in this building ought to make your mind up regardless of where life takes you if life takes you to college if life takes you to a job wherever it is or whatever it is God does with your life just make your life mind up the number one thing you're going to do in your life is give it to the Lord Lord you've got my whole heart for my whole life and I am loving it to you so that you can make a profit out of it this evening so I just want to preach for a few minutes on the loan that made a profit you say, where do I loan things to God at? Well, I personally believe when you read in the New Testament, there's a couple of references about this. The Bible talks about over there in the New Testament that the Lord, Brother Goodson, gave some men some pounds and some talents. And when he came back, one of them didn't do anything with it. He had loaned him something, and he wanted him to make a profit out of it. And the Lord said this, Brother Phil, you should have put my money in the bank. You say, where's God's bank? You're sitting in it tonight. I believe the church is God's bank. It's where God distributes his blessings. It's where God distributes his dividends. It's where God works in his people's life. Let me just pause and say this. I believe everything, everything, I believe everything that God does on planet earth, he does it through the hub of the local church. Brother, you can't read that New Testament on this side of Calvary from the Acts to the Revelation and not come away realizing this, that everything God does, he does it through the local assembly of the local church. Everything God does. I mean, you say, I just get so sick of people saying things like this. Well, I don't have to go to church to be the church. I am the church. That's hogwash. You didn't get that out of the Bible. There ain't no such thing as a church of one. A church is a called out assembly. It's the ecclesia. It's a congregation of people. You're not a congregation of one. You're not an assembly of one unless you're some sort of blessed fire and schizophrenic tonight. I mean, brother, we got to assemble to be an assembly we got to congregate to be a congregation tonight I mean look here they say well you know I love God but I don't go to church that's that's foreign to the Bible when you read the Bible you find the book of Acts is written about the starting of local churches when you read Romans to Philemon it's written to either local churches pastors of local churches or members of local churches when you read over there brother and read the revelation it's written to seven local churches Churches, what God does, He does it through the bank of the local church. When you read that story about the Good Samaritan, the Bible said that that fellow found that old boy down there in the ditch. That's a picture of the Lord Jesus finding us when we was in the ditch, and He picked that old boy up that'd been beat. And the Bible said He took him to the inn. And when He took him to the inn, He left him there and said, "Take care of him, and I'm coming back." And He deposited things to. Him. He gave him money at the end. He invested in the end so that the end could then in turn help somebody else. Say what you're saying, preacher. I'm saying if you'll invest your life at the local church and you'll spend your life around the things of God and don't just keep it in here. Take it outside the four walls and live for God, not just but live for God at home like you live for God in here I'm telling you God can make a profit out of your loan tonight I do I want the Lord to make a profit out of my loan I, I've give God everything give God my children give God my life and I want the Lord to make a profit out of it how does the Lord make a profit out of this loan let me show you three things real quick three things real quick and we'll go to the house a loan that made a profit number one it's a sacrificial loan it's a loan that's built around sacrifice. Watch her sacrifice. Look at chapter 1 and verse number 24. Verse one, chapter 1, verse 24. 
And when she had weaned him, she took him up with her with three bullocks, one eat of flour, a bottle of wine, brought him out of the house of the Lord in Shiloh. And the child was young. Look at the sacrifice. And they slew a bullock and brought the child to Eli. She said, Oh, my Lord, as thy soul liveth, my Lord, I'm the woman that stood by thee here praying unto the Lord. We read verses 26 or 27 and 28. She said, I'm going to lend him to the Lord. It's a sacrificial loan. What did she sacrifice? Listen to me. She sacrificed her own wants and her own will. Brother Jordan, I thought to myself, I'm sure she wanted her will. Her wants is, I want to keep this child at the house of me. Y'all. She longed for this child. She's begged God for this child. Now she's got this child, and she says, you know what? I'm going to leave him down there at the, at the house of God. I'm just going to get his life all wrapped up neck deep down yonder at the house of God. Listen to me. I'm sure all she want, her whole heart, she wanted to grab him up, carry him back to the house. Can you imagine that first day back at the house when she didn't hear his voice in the house, when she couldn't hear him saying, Mama, I'm hungry. Mama, I'm thirsty. When she, I'm sure it broke her heart. I'm sure it about ripped her heart out of her chest. But she realized this. If I'm going to see God make a profit out of that boy, then I'm going to have to loan him. I'm going to have to do not what I will but what thou will I'm not going to be able to live my will but I'm going to have to live God's will can I say if you want to see God make a profit out of your life sir make a profit out of your family ma'am make a profit out of your life young person you're going to have to get your will out the way you say well I, I tell you I want to do this and maybe what you want to do is it, not going to be against the will of God maybe God will let you but what if God says no about what you want to do. I got. I. I. I am not against education. I. I am not against. Uh, 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 you know, uh, living life and and a career. I'm not against none of that stuff. What I'm saying is, what if the Lord comes by and says, "That ain't what I want you to do." I got a dear friend of mine, known this boy since he was a teenager. His name's Caleb Wilson. Y'all support Caleb Wilson around here? Missionary to Papua New Guinea. And when I say missionary, mission, great, great young man. Missionary to Papua New Guinea. When I say Papua New Guinea, brother, he's going off on, on an island down on the southern tip. It takes like literally three days of travel just to get to the tip of where he's going. Then you got to take a boat ride for several hours over to where he's going through pirate infested waters where they rob people at. And he's going down there with his wife and his daughter. I met this boy when he was a teenager. This boy was just graduating high school down in Roanoke, Alabama. This boy was so smart. I'm talking about, I ain't talking about no dummy like Cody Zorn. I'm talking about this kid was smart. This kid had a full ride scholarship to be an engineer at the University of Auburn. Now that's kind of a terrible thing. Uh, but anyways, he had a full ride to Auburn anyhow. And uh, he had a full ride scholarship to the University of Auburn. And that boy was fixing to go. His plan was, he said, God, I'm going to go there. I'm going to make a whole lot of money being an engineer. And then after I've made a lot of money, then I'm going to start serving you and give my life to you. And one day the Lord come by, Brother Jordan, and he said, this is what I want out of your life. I want you to turn down the scholarship, and I want you to be a missionary to Papua New Guinea. I mean, that boy ended up turning down the University of Auburn and a full ride to be an engineer to go to Papua New Guinea on the backside of nowhere to preach the gospel to people you and me ain't never going to see this side of heaven. You say what's that? That's somebody that said Lord I'm willing to make a sacrificial loan. Lord I'm not giving out of my abundance I'm giving out of my poverty Lord this hurts. Lord I don't even want to do this but I realize if I'm going to see you make a profit it can't be my will and your will. It's just got to be your will this evening. I say this you, you, you sit here tonight and you say well preacher I tell you what, I, I, I mean, I got my family in church. Ain't that good enough? No. Listen to me. For whatever reason, and I got ideas why, her way worked. Eli, the priest, has got two boys. His boys are in church too. 
You know how them two boys turned out? They turned out to be a couple of dirty fornicators. Well, I bring, I hear people say that, preacher. Well, I bring my kids to church. Yeah, but you go back home and live like dogs. If you think for, listen to me, mom and daddy, listen to me. If you think for a minute that that man is going to be able to correct in three hours worth of services, Sunday morning, Sunday night, and Wednesday night, if you think that man is going to be able to undo the damage that you are either doing at home or they are doing at the public school system, then you have lost your mind. There's got to be more done than just bringing them to church, sitting in the pew, and say, all right, fix them, preacher. No, you better go home and say, we're going to live a life of sacrifice too. We can't be just like that world. We can't act just like that world. We can't do just like that world. We're going to have a life of sacrifice and watch God do something with our life. It's a sacrificial own. What did she sacrifice? She sacrificed her own wants and her own will. Listen to me. What else did she sacrifice? It's a sacrificial own. She didn't just sacrifice her own wants and her own will. She sacrificed what was already God's. She didn't just I like this. She didn't just sacrifice her own will. She sacrificed what was already God's. Say, so what do you mean by that? Watch what your book said. Look down at verse number eleven. Look down at verse number eleven. Chapter one, verse eleven. She vowed a vow and said, O Lord of hosts, if thou wilt indeed look on the affliction of thine handmaid and remember me and not forget thine handmaid, but will give unto thine handmaid a man child, Lord, you give it to me. That's where it's going to originate from. God, you give it first. Then watch what she says. Then I will give him unto the Lord. You see what she's saying? Lord, all I'm giving you is what you have already given to me. I'm not giving you anything extra. I'm not giving you anything over and above. I recognize and I realize that you're the one who gave first. And all I'm doing, Brother Christian, is giving back what you have already given to me. See, I think we got this idea. We got a messed up perspective. Our perspective is, I'm really sacrificing. Boy, I'm, man, I'm telling you what, to live for God and serve the Lord, it's a real sacrifice. You're just giving to God what God's already given to you. Do you realize that everything you have, mister, that everything you have, sister, everything you got, it was already God's anyways. God just lets you have it on loan. Everything you got, your family, your house, your car, your cash, your clothes, your children, everything you've got, God had already sovereignly, providentially, graciously handed it into your hand to begin with. You say, no, I worked for it. Oh, I've earned it. Well, who gave you the strength to do that? Who gave you the ability to work? Who who gave you the ability? Who gave you the breath in your body and the heartbeat in your chest? It was God. And without the Lord first giving to us, we wouldn't be able to give anything back to Him. Brother, that Bible said, What? No, you're not. That your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which ye have of God, and ye are not your own. Ye are bought with a price. It was already His. We got to get over this mindset that I'm I'm really giving God something, man. No, you're just giving God what He already gave you. You're not giving Him back anything that He hasn't already put into your hand first. I was preaching a missions conference some years ago, and in the middle of my message, I stopped and I said, "If I asked someone to give me a hundred dollars." Would somebody be benevolent enough to give me $100? And right in the middle of it, a fellow shot up. I mean, before anybody could do anything, he flung his hand up. He said, I'll give you $100. And he'd been a faithful member of that church for years, and the pastor was sitting over here, and the pastor's eyes got this big. He said, well, he ain't never give me $100. The guy got up, handed me a crisp, fresh $100 bill. Man, I said, thank you, brother. I appreciate it. Walked up to the pulpit and everybody just blowed away. The pastors blowed away. I can't believe this guy just all of a sudden got in a real giving mood in the mission service. And I told that church, I said, y'all know why that fella right there gave me that $100? Why he was so quick to jump up and hand it to me? 
Because right before service, I walked up to him and pulled that $100 out of my billfold and I handed it to him and I said, now there's going to come a point in the, serv in the service, I'm going to ask for that $100 back. Don't you leave me standing here looking like an idiot. <laughs> when I ask for it back, you better jump up real quick or you're going to mess my whole illustration up. And he did. Jumped up, handed it back to me. And I told him, I said, the reason why he was so quick to give me that $100 back is he knew it didn't belong to him. I had already handed it to him and he knew it wasn't his. What kind of sorry low down skunk would he have been to sit there with my hundred dollars in his pocket and when I asked for it back him to just be like I don't know about your heart. No. The reason he was so quick to give it back to me is he knew it was already mine. I had simply gave it to him for a short time. And can I say, Mama, them good little youngins that you got, they're not yours. The fruit of the loom, uh, the fruit of the loom, fruit of the loom, fruit of the loom. Praise God. That's a faux pas, praise God, ain't it? I need, I need them things you got in the office over there. Praise God, praise God. The fruit of the womb. Fruit of the loom, fruit of the womb. Same difference, praise God. <laughs> the fruit of the womb is his reward. Children are in heritage of the Lord. I realized when we had all our children, they wasn't mine. They has gone. God just gave them to me. So when the Lord asked for all of them back, I said, Lord, <laughs> it ain't what I want my kids to be. Here they are, Lord. That money that I give every Sunday morning, the first day of the week, my missions, my tithe, the offerings that I give in different points and services at our church, you know why I don't do that stuff begrudgingly or of necessity? Because I realize it's already gone. I look at it like the Lord's real good to us, y'all. <laughs> the Lord could have said, 90% of it's mine, you keep 10. <laughs> Instead, the Lord said, give me 10, you can keep 90. Praise God. The Lord's a whole lot better to us than we make him out to be tonight. And all the Lord asks is for us to turn around and give back what he has already blessed us with. The loan that made a profit, it's a sacrificial loan. Got to hurry. Secondly, it's a satisfying loan. It's a satisfying loan. Why was it satisfying, preacher? Because this loan silenced her enemy. It silenced her enemy. Watch your Bible. Watch her enemy. Look at chapter 1. Look at chapter 1 and verse number 5. Chapter 1, verse 5. But unto Hannah he gave a worthy portion, speaking of her husband Elkanah, for he loved Hannah. But the Lord had shut up her womb. Verse 6, and her adversary. You'll find this woman back in verse 2. Her name is Penina. It's her adversary. She's a picture of the devil. Your adversary, the devil. And her adversary also provoked her sore for to make her fret because the Lord had shut up her womb. And as he did so year by year when she went up to the house of the Lord, so she provoked her. Therefore she wept and did not eat. Before she got this baby, preacher Foster, Penina kept poking at her. You ain't never going to have a youngin'. You ain't never going to have a youngin'. I tell you, you ain't never going to get a baby. Look here, I'm a baby making factory, and you ain't never going to have a youngin'. And then all of a sudden she has one. Listen to me. Don't you know, don't, don't miss this, don't you know after Hannah walked to the house of God and handed that baby off, don't you know when she went back home, Penina fired back up again? Don't you know she fired back up and started saying, you an idiot. You finally got your baby and now you ain't got it no more? You are a fool. You are crazy. Oh, but brother, this loan ended up silencing her enemy. You say why? Because every year they'd come up, she'd see the plan of God in effect. She'd watch the plan of God at work. We already read it. We read where the Bible said all Israel knew this boy is supposed to be a prophet. He's working before the Lord as a child. Chapter 3 verse 1 said the child Samuel ministered unto the Lord before Eli. You know what I bet this woman said? She she probably said this, you're crazy for taking that young and down there to the house of God. That's all you ever do with him. Yeah. Right. He ain't gonna have no he ain't gonna have no social life. 
He's going to be weird. All you ever do is take that boy down there where that little old fat preacher keeps getting up and preaching the Bible. He's going to be backwards. He ain't going to know how to get along in life. Ain't that how your adversary does you about your youngins? Y'all, I've raised four kids in this world. I raised four youngins in a 40-foot motor home running around the country in church every night of my life. And I know what the adversary says. I've heard what the world says and what the devil says in my soul. And he says things like this. You're going to mess your kids up. Your kids are going to be so messed up and they're going to and they're going to grow up and they're going to hate church and they're going to hate the Bible and they're going to hate God. I'm telling you, that's what's going to happen to your kids. But y'all, here I stand and my daughter's 18 and my next one's 17 and my boy's 15 and the next one's 13 and I watch them just love God love the church and work at the church and serve at the church and I say God thank you I didn't listen to the adversary the adversary didn't know what they was talking about it's still right to invest your kids in the church it's still right to get them neck deep when you watch them serving God when you watch them playing instruments when you watch them singing in the choir when you watch these boys laying out at the altar praying when you watch them hugging each other's neck I'm telling you the world ain't got nothing on that I'd rather see these boys laying out at the altar than see them score a touchdown in the Super Bowl or hit a grand slam in the World Series. I'd rather see that boy over there at 14 on that piano playing the keys off of it than see him score the winning basket in the NBA Finals any day. This world don't know what they're talking about. You just keep loaning them to God. You just keep giving it to God and watch God make a prophet and silence the enemies. This world says if you don't invest your family in the world, then you're not going to be able to make a profit off of them. And God says you just invest them in me and you watch what I do with them. You watch what I can make out of them. Watch, watch the plan of God. Watch her see it. I love this. This is one of the sweetest little verses in all the Bible. Look at chapter 2. Chapter 2 and look at verse number 18 and 19. Chapter 2, verse 18 and 19. I'm running to the close here. It's a satisfying loan. Verse 18, But Samuel ministered before the Lord, being a child, girded with a linen ephod. Watch verse 19, one of the sweetest little verses in the Bible. Moreover, his mother made him a little coat, brought it to him from year to year, when she came up with her husband to offer the yearly sacrifice. Hey, Every year they come, Brother Christian, and they come to offer the sacrifice, and, Brother, they get in that service down there at the house of God, and they all have to come in and sit down. And here sits Elkanah, and here sits Hannah, and on that side, I guess, I don't know how it worked, maybe on that side sat Penina. And while they're sitting there, and the church service strikes up, out walks Eli to preach the word, and standing right up there on the platform next to Eli, there's little old Samuel with his little linen ephod, and he's a working in the house of God. And old Hannah just kind of looks down at Penina and says, Hey, Malone's paying off. Hey, look at Malone now. Check out Malone now, Penina. It's paying off pretty good now, ain't it? I'm telling you, uh, I, somewhere down the road, if you'll just keep serving the Lord, living for God, and investing your life in the things of God, you'll be able to look at your enemy and say, look what the Lord's done. Look how God's paying off in my home that's made a profit. The loan that made a profit, it's a sacrificial loan. It's a satisfying loan. Can I say lastly, the last part of this loan we see is it's a secure loan. It's a secure loan. Everybody talking about I want a loan that's secure where I don't lose out on it. You'll never lose out on this loan. You say, why is it a secure loan? It's a secure loan because of the person that she loaned it to. I want y'all to understand something tonight. Brother Jeff, she didn't loan this boy to Eli. We're not talking about loaning your family to the preacher. Loaning your family to the 
Sunday school teacher to the youth department. Look who she loaned it to. According to verse number 28 of, ver of chapter 1, chapter 1 verse 28 said, Therefore also I have lent him to the Lord. As long as he liveth, he shall be lent to the Lord. Can I say this? It's always a secure loan when you loan it to God. There's a whole lot of places you can loan your family and loan your life to, child of God, and it will not produce a profit, and it ain't a secure loan. But I ain't never been sorry. I've been sorry about a lot of things, but I ain't never been sorry about loaning my life to the Lord. Preacher, as an 18-year-old boy, I got saved and called to preach down at the house of God. And at that time, God called me in the ministry, and it wasn't long after that, just a couple of years or so, that me and my wife striked out in evangelism, just went behind the ears and didn't know nothing. I don't know much more now, but I sure didn't know nothing back then. But I look back, and I see that through my 20s, and through my 30s I mean brother the best years of my life the strongest years of my life I gave all them years to God you say preacher do you regret loaning the best years of you and your family's life to God I mean all your 20's you ought to have been having a big party somewhere all your 30's you ought to be I mean just making a big I'm telling you I don't regret looking back I don't regret spending my life for the Lord I don't regret loaning all to God as a matter of fact I wish I'd have done more with it brother you mark this down I promise you nobody that ever loaned their life to God wishes they hadn't but there's a whole lot of people that can look back and say I wish I'd have gave more to him. I wish I'd have got to serve him earlier. I wish I'd have walked with him more. I don't regret a mile of this trip tonight. <laughs> There have been many trials I've faced since I've started in this race. Many times it seemed no hope was in sight. There have been times that my valleys seemed so long, dark, and cold. But my Lord has been my friend all of the way. There have been many friends I've made since I've started in this way who have said I'll go with you all the way but now they've turned and they're gone leaving me standing all alone but my Lord has been with me all of the way personal testimony y'all it's been worth every mile and it's been worth worth every trial it's been worth every valley that we've crossed and it's been worth everything that we faced in his dear name and it'll be worth it all when we see his face I don't regret a mile of the journey it's a secure loan because of who I've loaned it to can I say this? I'm done. It wasn't just a secure loan because of the person she loaned it to. It's a secure loan because of the promise that's coming. <laughs> you say, what do you mean it's a secure loan because of the promise that's coming? I'm not sure if Hannah knew all of what her loan was going to end up producing way off down the road. But I come across a little verse the other day, Brother Christian, that plumb blessed my heart about Hannah and her little own preacher Goodson would you take your Bibles and look at one more verse of scripture Psalm chapter 99 Psalm chapter 99 Psalm chapter 99 is a messianic prophecy of the Lord Jesus Christ Psalm chapter 99 is right in the middle of these back to back to back psalms that are looking forward to the day when Jesus Christ rules and reigns on the throne of his father David for a thousand years on planet earth. Y'all, we still believe that's coming and it's going to happen. I mean, literally one day Jesus Christ going to come back get the church. 
seven years of a great tribulation and then he's coming back on a white horse and going to stomp out his enemies and a sword come out of his mouth and the blood's going to run to the horse bridles for miles and miles and then he's going to walk through that eastern gate that they've got sealed up and going to walk up in there and sit down on the throne of his father David and he's going to rule the kingdoms of this world for a thousand years and watch what your Bible said who's going to be with him the Bible said in verse 1 that the Lord reigneth let the people tremble he sitteth between the cherubims let the earth be moved the Lord is great in Zion he is high above all the people y'all this isn't figurative he's y'all them cherubims that John saw and Ezekiel saw them great winged creatures with faces like men, faces like an ox, face like an eagle, face like a lion, them great cherubims. There's literally come a day when Jesus Christ sits on planet earth. Literal cherubs are going to be on either side of his throne as he executes his fiery law for Jacob and the entire world. Now watch what your book said. This is awesome. Verse number five. Exalt ye the Lord our God. Worship at his footstool for he's holy. Look who's going to be there helping do the job of what he's got going on. Verse 6. Moses and Aaron among his priests <laughs> and Samuel among them that call upon his name. I don't know how all this is going to work but I do know Hannah's in that great number that's already went on. She was down there in paradise when the Lord went down there and on resurrection day when the Lord got up he got her out with the rest of them Old Testament saints and now she's up there and she's going to come back on judgment day with him on a white horse she's going to be here in the millennial reign I don't know preacher Foster while the Lord's up there executing his judgment on the whole world and the whole world has to come to Jerusalem according to your Bible and worship before the king and when they come up there will be the king in between them two cherubs. This is really going to happen, y'all. And working in that great priestly temple is going to be Moses and Aaron. And then standing somewhere over to the side doing the job over there that he was doing in the Old Testament is going to be Samuel. And maybe, just maybe, sitting somewhere out in that mighty host will be a little old mama. And she'll be sitting there saying... I sure am glad I loaned that boy to the Lord. Look, it's paying off. It didn't just pay off in time. It's a paying off in eternity. Look, look at my loan. My loan's still paying off. You say, what's that got to do with me? Well, I find this, that if you'll serve God now, the Bible said if we suffer with Him, we'll also reign with Him. If you'll loan your life to the Lord now, out there somewhere in that millennial kingdom, when the king comes back to rule and reign, you'll look and say, man, I sure am glad I give my life to the Lord. I'm not just talking about being saved. I'm talking about after you get saved. I'm glad I started serving the Lord. I'm glad I give my whole life to him. I'm getting to rule and reign with him now. I'm telling you, your loan will make a profit. The problem is we just with tight fists clench our lives and clench our stuff. We say it's all mine. And if we just get down to the bank, instead of coming to church and saying, Lord, do for us. Lord, give me something. Lord, give me something. What if we start showing up at the bank and say, Lord, here I'm giving you something. Just loan him. Just, just loan it all to him. You say, what if God does this? Or what if God does that? Won't you quit with the hypotheticals and just leave all that up to God? And God will make your life ten times better than you ever dreamed it would be. The most miserable people in the world are the people that try and clench their own life and keep it out of the possession of God. The happiest people in this world are those people who've just said, I don't just surrender, I submit. And I willingly give you what I got. And I want you to make a profit out of my loan. What about tonight? Do you want your loan to make a profit? Won't you come hand your family? Young person, hand your life to God. Say, Lord, make something out of my life. Let's all stand tonight. Father, I pray that you'd bless this simple little message from the Word of God. Lord, what a mighty, mighty prophet 
that was made out of a little old loan from a little old girl named Hannah. And there's no telling how many Hannahs there might be in this place tonight. The devil's fighting them and the devil's telling them, you'll be crazy for loaning your life to the Lord. Lord, tonight I pray they just block out all the noise. Get around this altar at the bank of God. Say, Lord, here's my loan. Here's my youngins. Here's my family. Here's my life. Take it, God. Use it for your glory. Make a profit out of it in Jesus' name. Amen. If you enjoyed today's message, head on over to ibcflorence.com and click on sermons. And don't forget to check out our other links in the notes section of today's broadcast. As always, thanks for listening.